Well, welcome, church family. Overjoyed that you're here with us today and just excited to be in his presence to worship the Lord. No matter where we are, we worship in spirit and truth. So join us now as we open in a word of prayer. Lord, we give you glory. We give you thanks. You are love. Lord, when this world pulls at us and, and tries to redefine the way things are, Lord, we can just go to you. We can rest in you. We can open your word and hear what you have to say to us. And there's just clarity. Lord, your word is pure gold, pure truth. So, Lord, we want to bask in your word and your presence this morning. We want to sit at your feet and hear what you have to say to us and, and honor you and glorify you because we love you. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Our God is our firm foundation, the rock upon which we can build our lives and find hope and healing and rest, all that we need. Let's sing. Our God, a firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground, as nations rise and fall. Kingdoms, once strong, now shaken, but we trust forever in your name.
He is our healing hope, the light in the dark, the one who we can turn to and find everything we need in him. Let's sing to him. Oh, you lift my eyes with love, and you will give me peace. You suspend the skies above, and you hold all of me. You know.
side we will not be shaken we will not be shaken we will not be shaken times I fell still your mercy remains and should I stumble again still I'm caught in your grace everlasting 
Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all faith. pray and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Lord, we give you praise, and we thank you. Lord, you have done everything to make it possible for us to live full, rich lives. Lord, give us the wisdom to embrace you, Lord, to make you the center of everything in our lives, to make you the focus, Lord, especially when we face challenges and heartaches and hardships. Lord, we rejoice that you truly have overcome it all. And because you reign, we get to be with you forever. Lord, I just give you all the thanks and praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. This morning, 11 o'clock, we've got the usual uh, children's ministry. 
youth and adult Sunday school. Also a reminder that this month, the uh, leadership offering is Spirit of Martyrdom. And uh, through that ministry, we can support our friend Russell Stendhal and his work in Colombia and Venezuela. So let's just turn our hearts to the Lord one more time in prayer. Lord, you are a good God, and you are a faithful God. And I pray that you would just lay a foundation in our hearts today to, to love you more, to give you our all. Lord, I'm so grateful for your word, which is just a, a light, a lamp to our feet. Lord, I thank you that you knew in advance what we would need, and you've provided it through your word, through your spirit, through many other things. And I just give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll start out with a, a, a lot of questions for you today. First of all, it's kind of tying to what we saw last week. Do you find living for the Lord to be challenging and at times painful? When you're suffering, do you easily get distracted or discouraged? If you were being treated harshly or unfairly, how might you respond? Here's a very important question. If God really loves us, why does he allow us to go through so many hardships? A lot of people have been asking that in recent year and a half, two years. Gosh, if God loves us, you know, like we talked about last week, doesn't that just sort of make mean life should be easier? From God's perspective, what's the purpose of pain and trials? And does God really expect you to submit yourself to every human institu institution, you know, governments and such, for his namesake? As you look around our community in this world today, what fears motivate people? What do you see? And how does obediently following Jesus as Lord free someone from those fears? Are you a hopeful person? If you answered yes, what exactly are you basing your hope on? And does the hope that is yours in Christ impact your life on a consistent basis? How many of you have been Christians more than 10 years? Would you say that it's harder to live for Christ today than it was 10 years ago when you first began? How many of you believe that Christians are starting to face persecution and hardship in this country? We used to talk about that that one day, but it seems to me that at the top of the list for those being canceled, those being attacked, are Christians. They're people that believe in God who want to follow scripture. How hard do you think it is to be a Christian at Abbott Junior High or Hillsdale High School or maybe the University of California these days? How hard it is, to, is it to be a single person who's a Christian and wants to follow God's word and especially when it comes to morality and sexual purity? What's it like trying to be a Christian business owner today? What are some of the challenges or hassles that you're currently facing because of your faith in Jesus? And how should you respond? And I think we could all agree that living for the Lord is not easy, right? I think we've established that. And as I read through Scripture, especially when I look at books like Revelation and parts of Peter and other things that Paul writes and Jesus said, it, it's pretty clear that it's going to get even harder in the future. The closer we get to our Lord's return, the tougher it's going to be, which is why the study that we're going to begin today in 1 Peter is so important. It's so relevant for us today because what we're going to find is that these people were facing the same kind of challenges, the same kind of troubles, the same kinds of hurts and heartaches and issues that you and I are facing right now. And by the way, as we study through this powerful book, we are going to find the answers to all of the questions I just asked you, and so much more. Very rich study. So this morning, we're going to do things a little bit differently, not really going to dive into a passage and exegete it and work our way through it. Uh, there's so much in this book, and, and rather than having to continually go back and forth, I really wanted to just start with an introduction. And so... <clears throat> Excuse me. I want to start our study by setting the context and providing you with some important background information that as we move through this will not only help you better understand this letter, but it's going to help you apply 
what Peter is saying to your own life and to your own situation. And I really want to encourage you to be reading ahead. Um, every day, just take a couple minutes. It won't take long, I'd say, for probably the next three weeks or so. Just read through maybe the first 10 or 12 verses of chapter 1. So let's start with the historical setting. If we look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, <clears throat> it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, this letter is addressed to believers scattered throughout the Roman provinces of, as we just saw, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, most of the people that Peter is going to be writing to were Gentiles, although some were Jewish Christians. And this area that we're talking about is what is known today as Turkey. It's modern-day Turkey is where all these different locations are. So, as I said, primarily it's Gentiles, but there were also Jewish Christians in these areas that he's writing to as well. And the Jewish Christians had been exiled from their homeland of Israel because of their faith in Jesus. You can read more about that if you'd like in Acts chapter 8, especially verses 1 through 4. These Jewish Christians were forced to move into new lands, and, and they no doubt spread the gospel. Now, there, I want to give you a little side note here. When you start reading through the book of Acts, especially when you get in chapter 2 and the day of Pentecost and chapter 3, and you see this incredible movement of God, and, and well over 3,500 people came to Christ in one day. It was an amazing thing. And although there was some opposition from the Jews and such, the people really were thriving. And most of them had grown up in Israel, especially Jerusalem. It was home. It was comfortable. And it seems like they forgot what Jesus told them before he ascended, that they were to, you know, they were to go out into the whole world and share the gospel. But probably much like us, it was comfortable in Jerusalem. It was a nice place to raise a family. And so... They didn't go. And so one of the little interesting things here is that that's one of the explanations why God allowed some of this persecution and stuff to happen, and they were expelled. But as they were expelled and they moved, guess what? It was an incredible opportunity for them to start doing what God had told them, Christ had told them to do in the first place, start sharing the gospel. Now, this area I just read to you, uh, you may know that Paul extensively evangelized many of these areas mentioned here by Peter, but not all of them. Uh, for example, you can read in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 and 7, how Paul wanted to visit Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit would not allow him to do so. Now, the theme of suffering due to persecution is going to be prominent throughout this letter. Some scholars think that this persecution began under the Roman Emperor Nero in around 64 AD. I think it's more likely the, the sufferings were of a general nature, and we're common to most first century Christians. You know, we cry and whine a little bit now that there's a little bit of pressure in the United States on Christians. And we talked about that last week, that sometimes we may not want to be as open as we ought to be about our faith and the role that Jesus plays in our lives. That was nothing compared to what they experienced in the first century. It was really, really challenging. And it was hard. And often it was painful. And this suffering is referred to in, as various trials in chapter 1, verse 6, and it appears to be of a more personal nature in chapter 2, verse 15. And as I said, most of the readers were Gentiles, and this persecution primarily came because these new Gentile Christians refused to participate in their former lifestyle in sin. They were no longer sacrificing to idols and observing these pagan feasts that were highly charged sexually, and you know, they were now living a moral life and a, a pure life. And that really didn't sit well with many of their former friends and you know, countrymen. Now, the place that this letter was written to is referred to as Babylon in chapter 5, verse 13. Again, scholars believe that Babylon is symbolic for the city of Rome. And this view is supported by the fact that, you know, Mark, who was with Peter, was also in Rome with Paul during his imprisonment. Uh, as far as who wrote it, I, I have no doubt. I believe that the apostle Peter was the author. Um, 
again, some of these things, I tell you these things because they've been debated over time. But I believe that both the internal evidence and the witness, the testimony of the early church confirms the statement that we read in chapter 1, verse 1, that Peter, the apostle, wrote this letter. Uh, since the writer, as we're going to go through this, you're going to see has an intimate knowledge of the life and teachings of Jesus and was an eyewitness to the sufferings of Christ and all he endured. Now, why is that important? Well, if you look at the criteria for being an apostle, they, you know, when they were going to have to choose someone to replace Judas, what did they look at? You know, that the person had been with Christ, they'd been part of his, you know, his ministry and his teaching. They were a witness to his death and his resurrection. And so it's very important that the person teaching these things was a credible witness. Now, what do you know about Simon Peter? Well, we know that originally he was from Bethsaida and the son of Jonah and the brother of Andrew with whom he was a partner in a fishing business, you know, up in the Sea of Galilee at Capernaum. Uh, Peter first met Jesus near Bethany beyond the Jordan River when he was introduced to the Lord by his brother Andrew. Andrew's gift seems to be the gift of introducing people to Jesus. And when he met Jesus, you may recall, uh, Jesus gave him a new name, Cephas, which is the Aramaic, or Peter, which is the Greek, you know, literally meaning rock. He was chosen by Jesus as an apostle. Uh, even though he was quick to, to do rash things and often made mistakes, uh, you can just, even reading about him in the Gospels, he was a natural leader, and he often served as the spokesman for the 12, even in representing them to Jesus. Now, it's also important to know that along with James and John, he was part of Jesus' innermost circle. I know there are some that like to believe that, you know, Jesus, there was nobody set apart, everybody was the same. That's just not what we see. We know that multitudes, thousands, literally thousands of people followed Jesus within that group. There was maybe 120 people that were especially committed and followed him. A lot of the women were included in that who helped provide for his ministry. We know that he chose 12 out of that group. And out of that 12, there were three that were closer to him than the rest. That's just the way it was. They formed sort of this innermost circle. And these three got a front row seat for many of the most incredible things Jesus did. Uh, for example, the three were present when uh, Jesus raised the synagogue leader Jairus' daughter from the dead. Uh, the three of them were at the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember when, you know, Jesus is glorified and transfigured and his face is his garments white as the sun and Moses and Elijah are there. These were the three that when Jesus, the night before he was betrayed, or actually hours before he was betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, took with him to pray. We know from our study in Matthew they didn't do so well with that. We also know that Peter and John were eyewitnesses of the empty tomb. And Peter took a position of leadership among the disciples after Christ's ascension. You know, played a key role. I mean, as you read through Acts, you could... You know, with the exception of chapter 9 and Paul's experience, the first 12 chapters of Acts are primarily about him and his ministry. He was the, you know, the, the, basically the preacher or teacher on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. And we see as, as we move through Acts that he was a key instrument for God to open the way of salvation, first for the Samaritans and later with the, the Gentiles. You can read about that in Acts chapter 10 and 11. According to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5, in his later years, Peter traveled basically as what we might call an itinerant minister with his wife. Uh, we know that he went to Rome around 62 AD, and he wrote this letter either in AD 63 or early in AD 64, and he was crucified in Rome during Nero's persecution of Christians, which began in A.D. 64. And according to tradition, he insisted on being crucified upside down. Let me give you a little insight here. He and another key apostle, they were honored to be killed in the way that Christ was killed. But Peter did not feel it was right for him to be killed, crucified in the same way, so he requested that he be crucified upside down. So let's talk about, because this is going to be really important in the coming weeks, let's talk about the purpose, you know, the, the importance of this letter. 
This letter was intended to exhort Peter's readers to conduct themselves in accordance with the living hope that was theirs as redeemed believers in Christ. You know, too, we've talked a lot about this, you know, live in light of what Christ has done on the cross. Live in light of your future. You know, so instead of reacting to stuff like we often do, they needed to live in light of those truths. Now, it's also clear that Peter was anticipating more intense persecution in the future. Things were tough already, but they were really, it was really going to ramp up. And so he wrote to encourage them in both their present and future situation. Another aspect of this is that his his letter confirmed their knowledge of salvation. You know, these are the things that you believe, these are the things that Christ said, this is what you've been taught, this is what's important. Another thing, and this one I, especially as we face the early parts of the pandemic and stuff, I think challenged uh, a lot of Christian scholarship. And I don't think many agreed with what Peter said, but as you're going to see, he urged his readers to submit themselves to those in authority. They didn't look for loopholes. They didn't try to use other scripture. They were to submit to those in authority. And he also called for a joyful response to suffering for Christ's sake. Now, we're going to make a distinction in this letter. If you're suffering because of your own bad decisions, if you're suffering because of things that you have done that are not right, That's a different matter. And so Peter makes a distinction here about when you suffer for doing righteousness. You know, when you suffer because of your identification with Christ. And I think that's really going to, that's going to be a really big point of contact for us. Because many of us have been and are starting to even more suffer because of our association with Christ. for wanting to live for him. Now, there are two major concepts I want you to be alerted to and to be looking for as we study 1 Peter. Suffering and hope. Throughout this letter, Peter will talk about suffering again and again in trials. But he doesn't simply discuss the pain associated with suffering. Instead, what he does, and it's really fascinating, he places the fact that Christians are going to suffer in this world within three distinct concepts of hope. First, he reminds us that suffering takes place under the ultimate power of God. In other words, nothing is being missed by God. I know sometimes when I'm hurting or I'm struggling, I wonder, does God notice? Does he care? Well, Peter assures us that God sees, God knows. He is ultimately in power and control, and he's going to bring his people through those things into the fullness of our redemption. That's the first hope. The second thing that he says to give us hope is that those who cause unjust suffering one day are going to face the righteous judgment of Almighty God who will judge all evil. So we look at our world today and we look at some of the people profiting and doing these things just out of money, selfishness, greed, whatever it may happen to be. Well, God sees... And those things, and just a little side note here. We are not called to judge and punish, unless you've been put in an official capacity as a judge or something. That's God's work, not ours. Third, this third hope is that as Christians suffer, we're supposed to remember, we need to remember, that we do so in the presence of Jesus Christ, who has gone before us and is our in is our example of how we are to deal with these things, how we are to face these things. And that's really important. So there's these three aspects or contexts of hope. Now, in addition to suffering, Peter continually raises the issue of holiness. Now, when he talks about holiness or when I talk about this, what I'm talking about is godly conduct, You know, that you have God-honoring behavior and attitudes. You know, especially in this context of suffering. As we suffer, as we face challenges, as we hurt, as we struggle. 
Peter is going to show us again and again how critical it is for us to see those things from God's perspective and to conduct ourselves. That's why we submit to those in authority over us. That's why we submit in the family, all these different things, because we understand that Christ really is over all. And so, as you're going to see, all of his words about suffering and hope point really towards one result. Godly behavior as you live in the present. Now, a little side note here, this is not legalism because that is not a requirement to be saved or to get into heaven. As you'll see, it's, we live that way, we do those things because of the secure redemption we have in Christ. In other words, I know I'm saved. I know I belong to God. I know that in spite of my flaws and all that, God loves me and I have been redeemed. So, in other words, the hope that we have for the future is secured not by something we do, but by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And again, that is a really relevant thing for you and I today. There's, there's a lot that's happened. We all have had our moments. We've been very honest with each other, I hope. There's days we struggle. There's days we're angry, we're upset, we're hurting. It kind of comes with the territory. But it's continually going back to that you know, it's what Jesus has done, and it's sufficient. Now, another major theme in this letter is God's grace. Now, the word grace is going to be used at least six times, and each time it's filled with meaning, and he uses it very diversely. And its usage includes the various stages of salvation accomplished by God through Christ, so sort of as we're working out our salvation. We talked, and we've looked at some of Paul's writings in that. But it would include, and this is really big for Peter, the favor that God bestows on Christians who suffer for righteousness' sake. See, when we live in a world like this and we continue to do the right things because we love God, because we're submitted to God, and we suffer for that, it's like it activates some special things in God. He's going to be more present with us. He's going to give us, uh, when, when some of the battles and things we've gone through, it's like every time we got hit, God came in and topped it and just gave us encouragement, gave us hope. And so that's one of the kind of things that Peter has in view, this, that stage. Uh, it is also going to include the, the various gifts, or what I would call divine enablements, that God bestows on his people, and also God's sustaining or enabling grace, which he lavishes on suffering Christians. We've talked about this before. Paul unpacked this pretty deeply in 2 Timothy. Uh, many times when you call me or ask for prayer, I pray for God's enabling grace. Pray that for myself on a pretty regular basis. You know, there's these special endowments, these special powers that I'm going to ask God to give me that today. I'm going to ask him for the strength to get through this thing or that challenge, to have the right perspective. And that's something that God promises to do for us and he loves to do for us. That's why it's so silly when we try to be tough and figure it all out on our own. We don't, it doesn't really work and we don't need to. Now, there's another area, and as I've been working on this for a few weeks, um, there's one area in particular <clears throat> that I think is really going to challenge us in our study. And it's not going to just happen one Sunday. I think it's going to happen repeatedly. But this is really, really important. Peter is going to constantly call you and I to godly behavior and godly attitudes despite our present circumstances. So it doesn't matter what's going on. In the world, it doesn't matter what's happening in our government, politics, the social thing, whatever you want to pick. He's going to call us, he's going to challenge us that we need to live the right way, we need to think the right way, and we need to have the right attitudes. Now, part of that, as I've been working on this, I realize is that the problems that Peter is going to address or the, the issue that he is addressing is, is the real or potential danger of you and I grumbling and complaining and the disobedience that can often occur because of unjust suffering. You're going through some hard times. 
Things aren't working well. You're hurting. You suffered this loss. This thing's happened. That thing's happened. And when we're suffering, we've talked about that before, how many times pain distracts us. It distorts our, our view. And so what I'm trying to get at, and I think you'll see an application of this in a second. See, Peter's readers were in danger of misunderstanding the reason for their trials and suffering. You know, they were in danger. Well, okay, all those questions I asked, does God really love me? Why is this happening if, if God is so powerful and good and all that? And look at our current situation. Like some of the questions I've asked myself and I've heard other Christians ask about COVID and all these different things. Some real opportunities. Some Christians, like I said, they got really upset and angry over lockdowns and some of the shutdowns and, you know, we're going to fight back, we're going to do this or this thing, this mandate or this issue. Um, that's why when we go through trials, when we go through hurts, we always need to first go to God and say, Lord, you can protest if it's wrong, it's unrighteous. Protest it for sure. But at the same time, we also need to be able to say, Lord, what do you want to... I know this had to come through you, so what do you want to teach me in this? How do you want to change me and mold me and my attitude and behavior through this? You see, you've got to understand, just like us, Peter's readers were in danger of misunderstanding these things. And if they did misunderstand, that could cause them to drift or to slide from their intimate relationship with Christ, to move away from him. And then it would be easier for them to follow their hatred and their lusts and their former way of living than it would be for them to follow the perfect example of Christ. And I've heard that. I've had Christians say, oh, yeah, I'm done with Zoom. I can't do this anymore. I've got to, okay. But you're moving away from Christ. We're not looking at him the right way. And when we're going, and, and see, for most of us Americans, we haven't suffered much. I mean, we think it's suffering, but when you look at what our brothers and sisters face around most of the world, we've had it pretty easy. We've had it pretty good. And so when we start to hurt or we're struggling, again, that pain, those things can get us to start looking and thinking the wrong way. And so the way that Peter is going to address these issues is by reminding his readers about the history of their redemption. I'm going to read this to you. It's a pretty long section, but I just want you to just, just sit back and listen. And hear what he's saying. It's really important. We're going to spend probably uh, more than a month just unpacking this section, but listen to what he says. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fight, fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So it's solid, it's a lock. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, you know, in the end times, at the end. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Now here he's going to tell us, here's the reason for these various trials. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the second coming. And though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. And here's the result. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your soul. Is that incredible? As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. In other words, all the prophets who had come before, they longed for this day. They looked for this moment. They were anticipating what God would do through the Messiah. Seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. In other words, it wasn't about them and in their lifetime, but you. 
In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things also which angels long to look to. This stuff is so incredible. The angels in heaven are just transfixed. They're just blown away by these incredible things that God has done through the Son. Therefore, remember therefore is connected from all the previous stuff. So in light of all these things you got going for you, Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. In other words, when you didn't know God, when you were far from God, don't fall back into those old ways of living. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father, the one whom impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on the earth. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but you were redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. In other words, he existed before God ever even created this planet. But he has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but is imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. And this is the word which was preached to you. This enduring, never-ending word, that's what we taught you. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all Slander. It doesn't say if they deserve it or you're right in your thoughts about them. It says all slander, anyone, everyone. Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. When we get to this section, I'm going to read this to you a little because I think the Greek construction on this should actually be a reverse. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord... Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so the body may grow in respect to salvation, putting aside all malice, all deceit and hypocrisy and envy. See, these words that I just read to you, and again, we're going to spend a lot of time unpacking them. But I just want you to see kind of the big picture because it's going to help as we move through. I think what, what Peter's getting to is that if these people lost sight of Christ and all that he had done for them, You know, if they weren't solidly grounded in God's word, their behavior, their actions, their thoughts, their attitudes could easily be compromised. So Peter reminds them and us of the history of our redemption. We need to understand what God has done for us in Christ. This incredible breakthrough that he has made, and we just got done studying over the Christmas, you know, his becoming man, becoming the incarnation, all these things that he's done. We cannot lose sight of those truths, those realities. Or when we struggle, when we face times like we've been facing these last few years, we're going to become embittered. We're going to get angry. We're going to be fearful and all these things that will, in reality, undermine our relationship and our confidence in God. Now, Peter is also going to reveal and discuss the problems associated with unjust suffering. And he's going to explain to us how all that is going to be resolved in God's final revelation. See, the way I look at it is when Christ comes, everything is going to be brought to light. Every injustice, we see wicked people prospering, we see all kinds of things being done to whether we're human trafficking, drugs, politicians, all this stuff, all that will in fact be dealt with completely when Christ comes back. And so we don't need to fear. Now, another element here 
this one, I, I, Doug and I were talking about this today. I think it even surprised him a little bit. Maybe I'm wrong, but when it comes to the use of the Old Testament, 1 Peter stands out among all the New Testament letters. According to one well-known New Testament scholar, Best, uh, he says Peter directly quotes nine Old Testament passages and alludes to at least 22 additional passages. I, I did a, a, a major study on this in a paper. I think I saw over 70 Old Testament allusions. Because what Peter does, he's so steeped at this point in the Old Testament that he's actually sort of able to re- just weave it right into the text. So it's not like you're seeing quotations, but if you know those Old Testament principles or ideas, you're like, wait a minute. I know where that, I've seen that. I know where it comes from. And so he takes these allusions from the Old Testament and he just weaves them throughout his letter. And of course, that gives additional authority because he is one with what God had revealed through the prophets. But there's another thing here that I want you to see. This one's kind of important. Peter really lives between the Old and the New Testament more than any of the other writers. I know Paul, his doctrinal stuff and things, phenomenal, incredible. Dealing with the law and all that with his background, fabulous. But really, more than any other book in the New Testament, 1 Peter forms a bridge from the Old to the New. In fact, when we do what we call biblical theology, which is where we're trying to connect the two Testaments, when we're trying to show the continuity between the, the old and the new, you know, you always start at 1 Peter. It's a short little letter, but he really does a better job than anybody else because, he, again, this guy's thoroughly Jewish. We forget this. He's steeped in these things. And here near the end of his life, the Lord has helped him. He's put everything together. So when you read 1 Peter, you're going to see these bridges, this bridge all the way back to the old that is, is essential. Now, it's obvious that Peter's readers needed some encouragement regarding Jesus as both a security for Christians and a liability or danger to the op- opponents of God. You know, they needed to know that their faith in him was not in vain, that he was exactly who they'd been taught, that he was powerful, that he was with them, that he was for them. But they also needed to understand that in the end, justice is going to be done. And we need to remember that too. And I want to talk about quickly some of the needs that are met by this letter. This is where I think you're going to see some real just connection for us and why I think the Lord has us going here. This letter is written, you know, it speaks to Christians who are hurting, are going through some really hard stuff, and it looks like in the future they're going to be going through some even more difficult things. And they may be tempted to lash out or seek revenge to keep score, to pay back, to to make the focus on the events or whoever the source of that pain is. And so, in contrast with their blessed position, this incredible salvation that is theirs in Christ, these Christians faced unjust persecution. You gotta understand, at this time, in these cultures, the loss of most of their material goods and lives you know, in a lot of these pagan cities, you know, you know you, let's say you owned your own business or you worked for yourself, which many did. Well, now you're a Christian, you're, you're cut off. You know, they might stone you, may, they may beat you or kill you. Even the Jews were killing Christians thinking they were doing a service to God. But you could be completely, you know, if you're a Jew, you're completely, you know, exiled. Out of the, you're out of the community of faith and everything's centered around the synagogue and Judaism and Jewish life. But same thing for these Gentiles. They're losing their businesses. They're living in their homes. A lot of bad things are happening. But despite all of that, God was calling them to live in obedience to his word. And of course, the irony here is that it was their very obedience to God (laughs) that brought about the world's hatred and persecution. And that's just the same as it is for you and I today. And we make a stand and say, well, yeah, these kind of, you know, we're against abortion. We're against 
this kind of relationship. We're again seeing these kind of movies, this kind of language, this, this behavior, lying, deception, all these things. Well, it puts you on the outs, especially in this counterculture today. I mean, it seems to me, um, it's amazing. Christians are being censored like never before. You, you make certain comments about God. I know Salem Communication, Salem Radio, they put together some pretty powerful videos. They've completely been banned from, you know, the only way you can get their information, they can't even put it on their own website now. It comes down. And yet, you know, leaders in Iran can put out their video, if you saw it the other day, of how they've got a little armored vehicle that's going to come in and kill Trump at his, on his golf course. But that's okay. Human traffickers, all that, they're okay on Facebook, Instagram. You want to talk about God and Christ? That's, that's an issue. They don't like that. And, but despite all of that, God was calling them to stand for him and, and to realize that it was their obedience to God that brought about the world's hatred and position. So these Christians, got to understand this, these Christians, many of them younger Christians, faced a really tough decision. They could obey, live for the Lord, and continue receiving the world's hostility, or they could lessen their obedience to Christ. They could sort of try to put their, if you follow the, the analogy, they could try to put their light under a bushel. They could try to hide it. You know, who am I to inflict my faith on you and all these justifications people use to not really stand for the Lord or be out front about who and what they believe in. And they'd be able to live a more comfortable and persecution-free life in the present. Does this sound familiar at all? For it is. Okay, you know, if that's your belief, yeah, shut up, keep it to yourself. I don't know, have you seen the new thing that just came out on Windows? When you're, next time your computer updates? So if you say, for example, uh, Postman, it's going to pop up in purple and tell you that's wrong because that's the wrong kind of language. You, you, should, you know, that's a post person or, you know, it's like this. I don't know if you caught this one. This one kind of blew me away. Snowman is wrong. You know, that's divisive. That's racist speak. Right? I guess they're snow people. I don't know. I didn't know snowmen even had gender, but, you know. But you've got to understand that if you don't talk about your faith, if you don't talk about the hope that is yours, if you're not really living openly for the Lord, they'll probably back off. And that's, again, why I say this is so relevant and appropriate for you and I today. As we start to move into an area we haven't faced before, some of the challenges that are going to come before our faith, what will we do? And Peter is also going to explain in detail the purpose of suffering and the proper Christian response to it. And that, I think, is so important for you and I. God's really honest and true with us. We are going to suffer. We're going to deal with these things. And so Peter's going to teach us as aliens and strangers who are living in a hostile, ungodly, broken, sin-dominated world how we are expected to live and conduct ourselves in a way that honors and brings glory to Almighty God. That's why Peter gives instructions here that are intended to clarify God's will regarding, you know, how to live as a Christian in the midst of hostility and suffering. This is your attitude. This is your behavior. And again, I know there's some that don't like this. This is what you do to the government, with the government. You submit. This is what you do to those in authority. This is what you do in your marriage. This is what you do. He spells it out. Now, I know that's not popular with even many that say they're in the family of faith. But these commands, along with Peter's personal testimony, is the primary theme of 1 Peter, which I believe is how to live as a Christian in the midst of a hostile, ungodly world. How do you live for the Lord? How do you represent the Lord in a difficult place? And what he's going to do is he's going to give us a variety of examples and situations that we are going to face, just as people did in the first century, of this is going to come out, well, this is the right thing to do. When this happens, you do this. So it's going to be very clear. And these, you know, these, and, and you're also going to see, as I've sort of alluded, hope is an essential word in this letter. And it is foundational to everything that Peter is writing here. So you and I really need to understand the way that he uses it, because Peter doesn't use hope the way it's 
use so much in our culture. We've talked about this many times, but just as a way of a quick review, you know, for many of you, you hoped for a certain thing to happen at Christmas or this and that, and it may or may not happen. The New Testament talks about hope. It's money in the bank. It is certain. And so for Peter, when he talks about hope, that's based on the fact that a Christian is born into a life of hope based on Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. And because of those twin realities, he's telling, going to say the future is absolutely certain for God's people. I already read that to you today. So no one can take it away from you. You can't lose it. It's rock solid. It's the foundation on which you need to build your life. But he also wants his readers to understand that a life lived with hope is going to be tested. And guess what? Testing, even though most of us don't like it, is really a good thing from God's perspective for us. So if you're trying to live for the Lord, I've seen that. We've got a, a number of people that, this year that I've been talking to, well, not just this year, last year, but as we're moving forward, they're growing. They're making a more intentional decision to live for Christ, right? Well, guess what? There's, there's conflict that's coming up. There's issues that you, they're suddenly facing they weren't facing before. Because the more you want to live for the Lord, the more is going to come your way. But Peter's like, that's a good thing. He also, you know, so he wants us to understand we're going to be tested. But he assures us that our testing is actually a really good thing. Because it verifies and makes our hope real. I have to tell you, and I've told this before, the most, the, the place I have most often grown and grown the deepest is when I've been under the, in the deepest water. The most painful, the hardest times that have come. Because the first thing it makes me do is question, and, or answer the question, who is God? Who is my God? Is he really who scripture says or not? Can I trust him? Is he really in control? I keep telling you this. If you can solve that biblically, if you come to that point of this is who God is, this is what I believe, all the other stuff is going to just kind of line up for you. But until you resolve that, if you're somebody that continues, you want to believe those things, but if you kind of keep kind of going up and down, you're tossed to and fro, you're, you're full of faith and you're not so sure, then that's the issue you got to start with. Who is God? And what does that mean for me today? There's another thing that, and this may not be true for you, but it's true for me. When I'm under pressure, when I'm dealing with hardships, the way I react is like a mirror being held up to me. And many times I find, okay, why are you scared? Why are you doubting? Why are you trying to take control and maneuver things the way you want? See, what I'm saying is it shows me where there's holes in my faith where there's weaknesses in my confidence in God. And again, I, I'm not, you know, that's a good thing. It, I talked to you about that last week. We shouldn't be afraid to go to the Lord. We should go to the Lord every day. Lord, Lord, show me where I'm failing. Show me where I'm wrong. Show me where I need to grow. Show me how to, we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should welcome that. And if you are welcoming that, these kind of things are easier. But that's one of the things about testing. It doesn't matter if you're talking about metal or uh, taking a test at school. It, it gives you an evaluation, kind of a, a report card of where you are, right? Moreover, he's going to teach us that as Christians, we can experience joy in the midst of our suffering. How come? Why? Because the hope that we have is a living hope. It means it's never going to fade or perish. Our hope is Christ, who's alive, who's seated at the right hand of God. Because we have a living hope, and again, if we're tapping into that, if we're believing that, it can't be taken away. It doesn't, it's good one day, it's not so good the other day, it broke yesterday, maybe it'll work today. No, it's rock solid. But see, folks, our hope as believers should, it must rise above the treatment we receive from those who dislike and distrust us. What I'm telling you is, our hope must be based on, you know, our hope must rely on the Lord and his sure promises that we have preserved in his word. So my hope is not that my back won't hurt so much tomorrow or 
this person will be in office or this thing or that. My hope is based on the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's risen from the dead. I have a future that is fixed. It is secure. Yes, I'm going to go through a lot of stuff in this life, but it doesn't change the end. It's solid. And that's what we need to be basing that hope on. If you base your hope on anything else, it's temporal at best. I really like what Chuck Swindoll said about this. He said, the point of Peter's letter, to put it simply, is that Christ gives hope in hurtful times. And then he goes on, he says, who better to know how to keep hope ablaze in a cold world of dark despair than one who has lived his earlier life in physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual gloom? See, bottom line, the purpose of Peter's letter was to remind Christians that painful trials are not the last word. We can see God is going to frustrate his adversaries and he's going to bring about his redemptive purposes through these periods of pain. In fact, many of us have come to Christ and many more will come to Christ if the Lord tarries because of pain, because of suffering, because of uncertainty. So God is able to take this. You know, C.S. Lewis said, pain is the megaphone of God. When you're hurting, when you're suffering, right? It's like suddenly you're a little bit more open. You're a little more willing to listen, to hear, to respond. And so Peter is going to constantly remind us of what you and I can so easily forget. Jesus Christ gives hope in hurtful times. And if you will believe that, if you will live in light of that, you're going to experience a lot less frustration, a lot less anxiety, a lot less fear as we wait for our Lord to come back. Now the other side of that is, if you forget about the hope that is yours in Christ, then right about now, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's probably a lot of anger. There's probably some depression and hopelessness thrown in there from time to time. But we need not live that way. Again, that's why this is so important. Now, before we close, I want to share just a few more of the questions Peter intended to answer for his readers through his letter. How are believers protected by God's power? What is the reason and purpose, you know, from God's perspective for pain and suffering in the Christian life? And what is the proper perspective, you know, the right attitude for a suffering Christian? And more importantly, how will having that perspective keep us from responding with anger and hate to life's hurts? You know, so that we don't become embittered, that we don't become frustrated. And why are Christians experiencing so much distress and pain if they really are God's children? They need to understand Peter wanted to help his readers both then and now experience the reality of two epic life-changing events that occurred for Peter. The first was the past example during the incarnation, the past example of Christ during his incarnation. We, read all, we went all the way through Matthew. It took us a long time. But remember, whenever Christ was treated unjustly, he would respond graciously. He didn't fall into the trap of seeking revenge or paying him back. Even on the cross, we talked about that. He had the power. He could have stopped it. He didn't, enter into, he didn't get into political debates and fight this or fight that or say, well, you know, my father trumps this. You got to do that. That's not what we see. The second event that Peter's going to emphasize is the resurrection of the saints that is yet to take place. He's going to show us because Christ is coming again. If, if you die before he comes, you're going to be raised from the dead. You're going to be with him forever. Because of that one thing, that's where all the hope has to be. See, I think a lot of times we've got it backwards. We want sort of heaven now. We want everything to be easy and smooth here, and we're not thinking about that this life is to prepare us for the next one. That this life, you know, I don't think any of us, once we're in heaven, are going to look back and go, boy, I sure miss those good old days in San Mateo or that trip I took to Hawaii or that cruise to the Caribbean. I don't think that's where our minds are going to be. I don't. Peter's encouraging us. Never your future. That's where your hope is. God's not done by a long way. And see, 
during times of suffering, pain, and injustice, he wants to encourage us to think about what our certain, though future, resurrection means for the present. In other words, live in light of eternity. Live in light of the fact that one day you're getting a brand new body. You're going to understand things. You're going to exist in a whole new way. All that stuff that characterizes his life, all the pain, all that, it's going to be gone. It's just like, don't get caught up in all this temporal stuff. Don't get caught in this movement and that thing. Focus on Christ and the future that he's preparing for you. But that's not all. He's going to implore us to not allow our present suffering and pain to blind us to these past and future truths. Because we've said this before, when you're hurting, when you're struggling, it's hard to keep looking to the Lord. There's many of you, and I've, I've talked to so many people, and you know, that have, it's been a hard, the holidays were hard, and the beginning of the year is hard. Serious illness, death, all these kind of things, real challenges. It's hard. Those things are real. It's not that you've imagined them. But see, when we look to Christ, we have reason to hope. Because we realize this is just a small part of our lives. Our real life is going to come when we are with him forever in eternity. And so he doesn't want us to allow our present situations and circumstances to distract us or distort the truth. Now, again, understand, Satan is going to constantly try to do that to you. He's going to try to convince you that that's, you know, some myth or that you're just so bad that God can't love you and all these things. He's, he's constantly trying to steal the joy that is actually already yours and is available to you. But ultimately, Peter wants his readers to have faith in God, no matter what we happen to be against, up against I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see what God is going to teach us and how he'll use what, you know, we learn to grow deeper in him. Lord, I thank you so much for your truth. Lord, I thank you for giving us a, a roadmap, a guide to lead us further and deeper. Lord, you never intended for us to live in fear, to be overwhelmed by the events, by the circumstances, by governments and social groups and institutions. Or do you reign? Since the beginning, you've wanted a relationship and you've wanted us to find our identity, our peace, our hope in you. And Lord, I pray that this would be a time like never before in which we really would just go all in. That we would allow your truths to transform, to change us, to inform us so that we can live with our heads held high not in ourselves, but in the confidence that you have overcome the world and that you're more excited to see us face to face than we are to see you. We give you praise, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, Messiah. Above all names, blessed Redeemer, and you the rescue for sinners, ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Thank you for 
Bless you as you go in his grace and strength. Have an amazing week in the Lord, walking with him ever closely. God bless.